despite the recent Vatican veto, priests in Germany are granting blessings to same-sex couples. And here in the U.S., the Vatican is urging bishops to use caution regarding pro-choice politicians and their worthiness for communion. The former head of the Vatican's doctrinal office, Cardinal Gerhard Müller, and theologian and author George Weigel are here with reaction. The Biden administration has redefined the term sex as non-biological. Will this eventually prevent Catholic hospitals from dispensing Catholic health care? Advisor to the Catholic Medical Association, Bishop Robert Basha, shares his concerns. And a cry for tradition in the midst of chaos. Op-ed editor at the New York Post, Sorab Amari, shares his new book, The Unbroken Thread. And finally, the U.S. State Department has just issued its annual report on international religious freedom. Former ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, is here with a reaction. A packed world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. What a show we have for you tonight. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. So much to get to. But before we get started, the Vatican's doctrinal office sent a letter to the U.S. bishops offering guidance on how to deal with Catholic politicians who support abortion in defiance of church teaching. We'll explore that letter in a moment, but the president of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, Archbishop Jose Gomez, asked if he could make public a 2004 letter from Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger when he instructed the U.S. bishops on this same topic while head of the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Well, Cardinal Ladaria, the present head of the office, said no. That 2004 memo, he claims, was meant as a private letter to the bishops, and Ladaria says he'll respect Ratzinger's wish that the letter not be made public, at least not in 2004. You might call this the return of Teddy McCarrick. It's clear that despite time and the horrendous public scandals, numerous sexual scandals, and even lying to the Pope, the Teddy McCarrick doctrine remains operational. Back in 2004, the bishops were contending with John Kerry, the last Catholic pro-choice Democrat who ran for the presidency. Cardinal Ratzinger wrote the U.S. bishops a letter, which he sent to then Cardinal Theodore McCarrick to share with them. It read, Regarding the grave sin of abortion or euthanasia, when a person's formal cooperation becomes manifest, his pastor should meet with him, instructing him about the church's teaching, informing him that he is not to present himself for Holy Communion until he brings to an end the objective situation of sin and warning him that he will otherwise be denied the Eucharist if the person in question with obstinate persistence still presents himself to receive the Holy Eucharist, the minister of Holy Communion must refuse to distribute it, must refuse to distribute it after a warning. But that's not the way Theodore McCarrick spun it. He never shared those words with the bishops at the time because he was more worried about protecting politicians than the sacraments. Instead, he told his fellow bishops, I would emphasize that Cardinal Ratzinger clearly leaves to us as teachers, pastors, and leaders whether to pursue this path. The question for us is not simply whether denial of communion is possible, but whether it is pastorally wise and prudent. Just another instance of Theodore McCarrick lying or spinning the truth. Here is a cardinal who committed unspeakable evils against young men. He was stripped of his titles, laicized, and yet the McCarrick doctrine lives. The church and the bishops have a choice to make. When deciding whether to deny recalcitrant politicians communion, they can either stand with Theodore McCarrick or Joseph Ratzinger. Those are the only choices. Now is the time to choose. The church, the people in the pews are watching. 
To help us make sense of all of this, I'm joined by the former head of the Vatican's doctrinal office, the CDF, Gerhard Cardinal Mueller. He joins us from EWTN Studios in Rome. Also, theologian, papal biographer, and author of the new book, Not Forgotten, George Weigel, thank you both for being here. Cardinal Louis Ladaria, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, in his letter denied the USCCB president, Jose Gomez's request to make public that Ratzinger letter, even though it's on the web. I don't know why it was such a big deal. But anyway, Cardinal Ladaria did acknowledge that the principles in Ratzinger's letter may assist the bishops in drafting their own document on the subject. But those principles, quote, should only be discussed within the context of the CDF's authoritative doctrinal note of 2002 on some questions regarding the participation of Catholics in political life. Cardinal Mueller, why not release the Ratzinger letter from 2004? It was so clear on this issue. Yeah, everybody knows the content of this letter and everybody knows the opinion of the former Cardinal uh, Ratzinger and, and the, the Pope uh, Benedict XVI. And the principles uh, are, are very clear. There is no reason to, to hide it. Uh, it is very clear that you are the Catholic in, in, in the public life and in the politics. You have to follow uh, the, the principles of the Catholic doctrine and you cannot uh, act in, in favor of ab abortion. Abortion is a, uh, a crime against the life of a human being, and therefore I don't see no chance uh, to enter into a dialogue about the life of uh, people, uh, only uh, how to do it. Uh, you can discuss, you can enter in a dialogue, but you cannot enter in a dialogue about the reality that human life is given by God, and we have to protect the life of God. And this is the first mission of the Catholic Church, to say the mm -hmm. truth. George, Cardinal Ladaria noted uh, that the topic of worthiness for reception of communion had been raised during the 2019-2020 ad limina visits of the U.S. bishops to the Pope, to Pope Francis, and that there were some steps that needed to be taken. He writes, the effective development of a policy in this area requires that dialogue occurs in two stages, first among the bishops themselves and then between bishops and Catholic pro-choice politicians within their jurisdictions, end quote. Uh, isn't this dialogue already underway, George? It's one of the most puzzling things about Cardinal Ladaria's letter, uh, Raymond, is that he doesn't seem to understand what's been going on in the uh, church and between the church and Catholic uh, public officials for the last 20 years, at least. Uh, the issue here is not whether, as the Cardinal's letter suggests, these Catholic public officials understand the church's teaching. The issue is that they reject the church's teaching. And in rejecting it, not simply abstractly, but in their actions as public officials, mm -hmm. They declare themselves out of full communion with the church and therefore, in terms of their own integrity, should not present themselves for holy communion. The other thing that I find simply astonishing in this letter from Cardinal Ladaria is its notion of consensus. The cardinal presses the bishops to come to a consensus on this question of Eucharistic coherence. Well, as I read the history of the church, the first council of Nicaea did not wait for the Arian bishops to agree with the Orthodox <laughs> bishops before teaching the truth about the divinity of Christ. At the council of Ephesus, the Nestorian bishops had their say, but when they were not persuaded, the rest of the assembly went ahead and taught the truth about Mary's title as mother of God. More recently, we have a, an example of this in the work of Pope Paul VI in the last phase of mm. the Second Vatican Council. The Pope was perfectly willing to let intransigents like Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre have their say against a conciliar declaration on religious freedom. He was not prepared to give them a veto over that. 
So he mm -hmm. went ahead, got the broadest consensus he could behind a strong declaration of religious freedom, but did not give the intransigence a veto. Why are we giving the intransigence a very small group within the U.S. Bishops mm -hmm. Conference today? Why are they being given a veto? This is not collegiality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cardinal Mueller, uh, in a comment that challenges the Bishops' Conference of the United States' position that abortion is the preeminent moral issue that voters have to grapple with and that Catholics should concern themselves with, Cardinal Ladaria writes, it would be misleading if such a statement were to give the impression that abortion and euthanasia alone constitute the only grave matters of Catholic moral and social teaching that demand the fullest accountability on the part of Catholics. Your Eminence, what do you make of that statement? And uh, as far as public officials are concerned, aren't those two issues preeminent for public officials to at least agree to? I think this is the first issue of the church to pronounce the reality or in the truth of of human life and this is a basic human right uh, to live and therefore we cannot balance other political aims with this basic human rights. We cannot say uh, in, in China some things they are making good in the economy, but they don't respect uh, human rights and therefore we must enter in, in a dialogue with them. I think uh, the first mission of the church is uh, to protect the human life because it is given by God and not the life is not one of values among other values as is a basic uh, value and, and therefore I don't understand ex exactly the meaning of this. Uh, we have a, a, a primacy of the moral and not of uh, political reasons uh, because uh, some in the Vatican are in favor of the government of Biden and therefore they want not to uh, enter into a clinch with them. If we, we cannot look uh, uh, in a diplomat, uh, diplomatic way uh, if they are content with us or not, we have to say the truth. It is uh, uh, Biden or, or Trump or whoever, he is the president or the government or the administration of the United States or in other countries, the first mission of the church is to declare the truth and that the basic rights is the life of everybody. I don't understand where here is the problem. And not mm -hmm. only to say, oh, later, 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 we make a dialogue uh, until the next uh, 100 years. And in the meantime, <laughs> uh, everybody is promoting uh, abortion and, and all this euthanasia, and, and we are making a dialogue. The, the Jesus didn't come for a dialogue in this way for, for hiding uh, the revealed truth, but the word, word of God is very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, George, Ed Penton is now reporting that Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago and Cardinal Joseph Tobin of Newark met with Cardinal Ladaria of the CDF just days before he sent this letter to Archbishop Gomez uh, urging the bishops to slow roll any document regarding this pro-abortion Catholics receiving communion document. Uh, both of these men oppose stricter rules on this issue. Your thoughts on the Supich Tobin visit to the CDF, um, and, and what does this say about synodality? I think it's quite extraordinary, Raymond, that two members of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, in which all bishops have an equal voice and vote, um, two members of a distinct, very small minority within the U.S. Bishops' Conference should take it upon themselves to go to Rome and try to get the Holy See to throw a spanner in the works of their brother bishops. And it seems to me that this ought to be discussed in executive session very, very forthrightly during the June bishops meeting. If this kind of interference had happened from the other end of the ideological spectrum, there would have been uh, an explosion of outrage uh, in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet it's happening uh, now. 
And moreover, Raymond, to go back to a point I was making earlier, uh, if Cardinal Sopich and Cardinal Tobin were in fact the sources of Cardinal Ladaria's information about what's going on in the United States, uh, they were not giving him the full picture. At every point yeah. in this discussion, the bishops have made clear that they are not one issue politi political actors, that mm -hmm. they intend to put this question of uh, Eucharistic incoherence among Catholic public officials in the context of a much broader Eucharistic incoherence in the church, in which so many mm -hmm. people, according to the polls, don't really believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, and that the bishops have addressed a broad spectrum of issues all the time. Cardinal Mueller, I need to get your reaction. Cardinal Ladaria seems to be discouraging the bishops from being too definitive in this topic at their June meeting. He suggests that, quote, dialogue among the bishops be undertaken to preserve unity of the Episcopal Conference in the face of disagreements over this controversial topic. The congregation notes that such a policy, given its possibly contentious nature, could have the opposite effect and become a source of discord rather than unity within the episcopate of the larger church in the United States. Your Eminence, does unanimity of thought trump canon law and truth in this case? And I think these two bishops came to Rome uh, as uh, members or representatives of the Democratic parties, but the bishops are the representatives uh, of Jesus Christ, of the revealed truth. And uh, we cannot uh, make here some uh, plays and games uh, of power and diplomacy and, uh, and, and, and uh, plays in the background. We must be very uh, open and, and real and, and respect the truth. And what always in the, during the 2000 years was very wrong, when the bishops was too close to the politic, uh, political reasons and, and, and games and so, and not on the line of uh, the truth. Cardinal Mueller, um, I'm going to let you take a crack at this and George as well. Do you believe the U.S. bishops will stand with Cardinal Ratzinger or Cardinal McCarrick on this issue of distribution of communion to dissenting Catholics? Your best guess, very quickly. <laughs> McCarrick is not a model for the for the future of the, of the Catholicism <laughs> in, in the United States or, or everywhere, uh, and and we know what were the problems. Not only surely the moral problems, but all the made politics and didn't uh, complete his his uh, mission as a successor of the, of the bishop the servant of, of the truth and uh, for the humanity and, and for the gospel and for the doctrine uh, of the church. And model for the bishops can be the Cardinal Ratzinger and the former Cardinal as prefect or, and, and uh, Pope Benedict and, and the other uh, popes. Uh, but uh, exactly... <laughs> Uh, Borromeo or all the great bishops after the, the Council of Trent and, and the reform, reform of, of the church, but according to the word of God and not for the interests of, 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 of the politicians. Uh, George, the McCarrick doctrine or the Ratzinger doctrine, who will, which one do you think the bishops will embrace before we move on to this Germany topic? I think the Catholic doctrine, Raymond, there is a critical mass of bishops in the United States who understand that this administration has put the church at a real inflection point, uh, certainly on the life issues, also on, on questions of basic biblical and Christian understandings of the human person, which this mm -hmm. Equality Act that the administration is supporting is about to criminalize. I think the majority yeah. of bishops, the great majority of bishops, understand that. We've had some real leadership from individual bishops, Bishop Paprocki, Bishop uh, Olmsted, Archbishop Aquila, Archbishop Corleone. I expect to see a lot more of that. And I'm hoping that both the Bishop's Doctrine Committee and the Bishop's Pro-Life Committee will be uh, making the situation very, very clear 
uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. I think this whole thing is going to energize individual bishops to take mm -hmm. up their mm -hmm. responsibilities with the Catholic public officials under their uh, spiritual guidance in a much more vigorous way. Mm. Okay, let's move on to this topic that I know both of you have strong perspectives on and insights into. Uh, more than 100 Roman Catholic parishes in Germany offered blessings to gay couples this past Monday in defiance of church teaching and their own bishops. On March 15th, the Vatican explicitly forbade priests from blessing same-sex unions. Cardinal Mueller, what do you make of this move by these parishes in Germany, and are we headed for a schism here? I think what happened in Germany, in some parts of Germany, was more a, a, a comic a, a tragedy uh, than, than nothing to do with the uh, Catholic uh, doctrine and Catholic uh, faith. And this is a provocation, a political provocation against the unity with Rome, against the, the clear uh, explanation of the word of God. The Bible is very clear in, in this point. And there is no, no possibility uh, to bless uh, uh, acts which are, which are a sin according to the Bible and to the word of God. Uh, nothing to other question with this uh, people which are involved in these uh, problems. But the Catholic Church or the Christians, all the Christians have to follow the word of uh, God. And this is a form of, of heresy, not only of, of schism, but also of, of heresy. And it happened in only in th those dioceses where the bishop is not very clear. And in mm. so much dioceses where we have good bishops, good Catholic bishops, uh, it didn't happen because uh, leading of the bishops is very good. And all, only in some... Um, some diocese where the bishop is, uh, is not a good theologian or, or don't know what is mm. the doctrine of the church or is looking more to the reaction of, of the mass media, there we have some problems. George, this German blessing event, uh, it was entitled Love Wins, Blessing Service for Lovers, end quote. It took place in Munich, in Berlin, Frankfurt, and Cologne. In a statement on the event website, it said this was in response to the Vatican's no to same-sex blessings. They said, we will continue to accompany people who enter into a binding partnership in the future and bless their relationship. We do not refuse a blessing ceremony. Uh, these pastors are acting, obviously, in open defiance of the church. What should be the response here, George? Well, I think Cardinal Mueller identified the, the root of the issue, Raymond, and it's important to get that clear. This is not simply a matter of ecclesiastical discipline. It's a matter of the reality and binding force of divine revelation. I've read many statements from priests who engaged in these ersatz uh, blessings this past weekend, and they uniformly say, we know better than God. We know better than the teaching of the Bible. We know better than the teaching of the church. This is apostasy. This is a denial of the fundamental reality of divine revelation and its binding authority over time. And if this is not addressed forcefully by uh, either the bishops of Germany, of whom I am slightly more skeptical than Cardinal Mueller seems to be, or by Rome. This would seem to be something to which Cardinal Ladaria should direct his attention. Mm -hmm. Then we are going to have a church in Germany that is de facto an apostate church uh, mm. and no longer uh, can be considered uh, as part of the communion uh, of Catholic faith. When you say we know better, then you are on a different team here. This, of course, was the issue, as Cardinal Mueller will remember, at the 2014 and 2015 synods, when you had right. bishops getting up and say, look, we know more about marriage than Jesus did, or we know more about worthiness to receive Holy Communion than St. Paul did. This is 
apostasy. And it's time mm-hmm. to start describing it for what it is. Yeah. Cardinal Mueller, in a statement, uh, Bishop Georg Botzing, uh, the president of the German Bishops' Conference, had this to mm-hmm. say to pastors organizing these blessing services for same-sex couples. He said, I do not consider public actions such as those planned for May 10th to be a helpful sign and a further path. These blessing services have their own theological dignity and pastoral significance and are therefore not suitable as an instrument for church political manifestations or protest actions. Uh, Cardinal Mueller, what do you make of Botzing's statement? He's clearly trying to distance himself from the event, uh, though it should be said uh, Bishop Botzing, uh, Botzing has called for widespread changes in church teaching regarding gay marriage and other matters. Yes, this distanciation is coming too late. Who is responsible for the point which, in which we are? <laughs> First, they spoke about uh, the possibility of blessings. They protested uh, openly against uh, the, the CDF, uh, against the responsum, against uh, the doctrine of the church. They are saying openly, bishops are saying, uh, what is written in the Bible is only a impression of, of a Christian 2,000 years ago and not the word of God. If you deny the basic mm-hmm. of, of uh, our Christian and Catholic faith, you, you cannot give an, res- an answer to, to this p- uh, provocation. It's not only po- political provocation. Surely the form is a political uh, provocation, but in reality it's a provocation against God, against the word, the revealed word of God. God created uh, the human being, man and, and uh, bim- woman, uh, and this, uh, this is a, uh, the image of God is consisting in the, uh, the both uh, genders, um, male and female, and no body in the world can change this uh, reality of uh, creation and the sacramental uh, rea- uh, reality is that the, the union of one man and, and one woman uh, in, the, in the marriage is a sacrament and nobody can change it and they cannot relativize uh, the word mm. of God in, in, in this uh, way. And mm-hmm. and some bishops uh, now uh, are the, 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 the are speaking very loud, and also the, the president. Uh, they are, don't have a real understanding of their own task as bishops. They must read the third chapter of Lumen Gentium. What is a bishop? And not mm. it's not a, a political actor in in the church and an ideology to promoting their own ideologies. They have to uh, see and to look to what is the revelation, the divine revelation. George Weigel, I'm going to give you the last word. How important is this moment in Germany? I mean, is this a stunt, or does Rome have to get involved here for the sake of the universal church? Well, I think for the sake of the exercise of his uh, Petrine ministry, uh, the Pope has to get involved, as as do his closest uh, advisors. Uh, This is quite serious. Um, And uh, if I could just (laughs) throw in a word for my book, which you kindly mentioned at the uh, beginning, Not Forgotten, the the two chapters in there on John Paul II, Uh, I think, give us an idea of how a genuine bishop acts. Uh, He acts in prayer. He acts in fidelity to the revealed word of God. He acts in fidelity to his oath as a bishop. Every bishop on the day of his ordination swears a solemn oath to teach the fullness of Catholic faith. That is not happening in some places. It's being fudged Mm -hmm. in other places, to go back to our earlier discussion about the United States. And uh, this is deeply problematic for the church uh, and therefore needs to be thoroughly aired out now and in the future. Your Eminence Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, George Weigel, thank you both for being here in George's book, as he mentioned, Not Forgotten, is available at bookstores everywhere. Thank you both for being with us.
Last week, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco released a pastoral letter on the worthiness required for the reception of communion. Now, several bishops are commending that letter to their flocks, including Bishop Hying in Madison and my next guest. He's also Episcopal advisor to the Catholic Medical Association and Bishop of Santa Rosa, California, Bishop Robert Vasha. Thank you for being here. You've encouraged your parishioners uh, in your diocese to read Archbishop Cordelioni's letter. Um, your thoughts on why? Why are you encouraging them to read it at this time? I think that the whole issue has been discussed nationally and great questions are being raised by a number of bishops. And I was very pleased to see Archbishop Cordelioni speak so clearly and forthrightly about the issue, as has Archbishop Aquila of, of Denver and Archbishop Nauman of, of Kansas City. And I, I think it's just important for our people to really prayerfully reflect on this issue so that they come to greater clarity about the actual evil of abortion and about the impossibility of supporting that and at the same time claiming to be an authentically good, faithful Catholic. Hmm. Bishop, as discussed in our previous segment, the head of the CDF has written to Archbishop Gomez uh, encouraging the U.S. bishops not to debate Holy Communion for politicians who promote abortion. Your thoughts on this and why is this discussion being discouraged by Rome, do you think? And certainly in public. I think Rome, Rome is, is, is very concerned about the unity of the bishops within a, an Episcopal conference. And as I read that message, it seemed to me that it was strongly encouraging bishops to be in dialogue with one another so that we come to some consensus before issuing a document. Uh, so that mm -hmm. that discussion, and the Holy See is always big on dialogue, uh, that that discussion, that dialogue take place prior to the issuance of even a draft of, of the document. Yeah. I, I have to say, as a layman, I'm a little frustrated, Bishop Vasher, and it's not your fault, but looking in on this, I don't know what you have to dialogue about at this point. I mean, it's a little bit like telling the, the husband and wife, you are man and wife, now we're going to dialogue about what happens next. We know what happens next. They get together, they go home, they live together, they have a family. We don't need a document and a dialogue and a, a recitation of what happens next. It seems this is the same sort of thing. You either protect the sacrament or you violate it. Uh, and, and I don't, it, 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 there seems to be a lot of hand-wringing uh, over political, uh, you know, offending politicians or political blocks. And I do worry we've lost the thread here, which is defending yeah. the sacrament the, and the meaning of that sacrament. There are several sacrament. things that come to mind. Your, your question about, or statement about dialogue reminds me of the, the wonderful forthright statement of, of Bishop Bresquitz of, of Lincoln. God bless him. Yeah. You know, he, he would say, when a fireman shows up at a burning house, he doesn't say, let's have a dialogue. <laughs> now, he, he goes to work on, on the fire. And so yeah. in some ways, I agree with you. I think that dialogue has already taken place, but we do need to establish a national clarity mm -hmm. uh, about how do we deal with those who are manifestly and externally not in keeping with this very central teaching concerning life. And as you're early right. as the fifth century, mm -hmm. St. Augustine and St. Paul, too, would say, if you're not in communion with the body, then receiving communion does not benefit you. You know, that mm -hmm. receiving communion actually hurts you because communion must exist in order to be fed and nourished by the reception of the body and blood of our Lord in mm -hmm. Holy Communion. And so we have to declare, are these folks who are pro-abortion, are they or are they not in the bond of peace, as St. Augustine would say, which is symbolized by the sacrament of the Eucharist? And it seems to me that they cannot be in a bond of peace when they hold so adamantly to positions which are clearly contrary to the clear and consistent teachings of our church surrounding the life issues. Mm -hmm. Bishop, this week, I have to move on. I wish I could talk about this further, but, but I guess we have to move on. Uh, this week, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Civil Rights Division, said it would interpret and enforce Title IX's prohibitions on discrimination based on sex to include discrimination 
on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, Bill Donahue, the president of the Catholic League, wrote this week of the new rule. It accurately conveys what both the Obama and Biden administrations believe. Being male or female is a subjective judgment, one that allows a man or a woman to deny that they are a man or a woman, or any sex at all for that matter, which means they could be an acorn. It is inaccurate because it is a fiction. One's inner sense of what sex one belongs to may be inaccurate. What matters is reality. On President Trump's last full day in office, January 19th, a federal court struck down the transgender mandate forcing doctors to perform transgender surgeries. Last month, the Biden administration filed an appeal. It wants to deny religious exemptions. Bishop Asha, what does this mean for Catholic hospitals and their religious liberty and conscience protections? I'm, I'm confident that with the Supreme Court that we have, ultimately they will weigh in on this. And our Catholic institutions, and not only medical facilities, but schools as well that are affected by this, have the freedom to say no. And really, they have an obligation to say no to this and to oppose these things up to the highest court in the land. And I'm confident that we would prevail in, in that venue. Mm -hmm. uh, during a Congressional Health Subcommittee hearing on Wednesday regarding the 2022 fiscal year HHS budget, Health and Human Services uh, Secretary Javier Bacera was asked if he understood that a statute prohibiting partial birth abortion exists and if he agreed with the law. Here's Becerra's response. The term partial birth abortion may be recognized in politics and by politicians, but it is not a medically recognized term. What I'm saying to you is that under the law, the a physician or any provider of health care must make sure that it, he or she it abides by the law. And right now, what our law says, and it's pretty settled, is that a woman is entitled to reproductive rights. And so my question is not so much with the the, the term partial birth abortion, it's with what the rights are of a woman under our statutes and under our precedents to provide her with reproductive care that she's entitled to. Your thoughts on this, Bishop? Uh, Becerra is also a professed Catholic, we should say. You know, it, it's absolutely contrary to the clear and consistent teachings of the Catholic Church, which always stands for human rights, authentic human rights, and human dignity. And they totally forget that the child is a human person as well as the, the mother. And to entitle and claim rights for the mother with and deny those same rights, a right to life to the child, is, is absolutely contradictory, contrary, and irrational. And unfortunately, mm. it plays into what Pope Emeritus Benedict would call the, you know, the, the uh, dictatorship of, of relativism, that that mm. thing is what they claim it to be. And that applies to all of the processes that you described earlier in terms of their desire to mandate Catholic hospitals provide all of the things that they claim to be somehow constituted as a right. And it mm. simply is a, a failure to recognize the dignity and integrity of the human person. I have to get your reaction to this. The Vatican held a health conference this week. Uh, Chelsea Clinton was there, Joe Perry of Aerosmith, uh, Deepak Chopra, an alternative medicine advocate. He spoke of the universal consciousness which religions might call God. Now, when asked why the Vatican didn't take the opportunity to raise issues important to the church, such as abortion-tainted vaccines or other church teachings related to health care, Monsignor Tomas Trafni of the uh, Pontifical Council for Culture and one of the event's key organizers said this. We are trying to do important work to show that the church can be a part of this discussion, that the church can help people to be more sensitive. So if we only blame others and condemn others, what can we really achieve? No one cares today about our condemnations. Um, Your Excellency, they want to be a part of the discussion. Is that enough? I mean, look, I fully support the idea of engaging everyone, but isn't the idea at least to propose an alternative way, an eternal way to approach these yeah. contemporary issues? 
It seems to me in order to justify a discussion, there have to be clear parameters about who listens to whom and what is mm. said. What are the, you know, the, the discussable, discussable items and which are not up for discussion? And to simply leave a blank slate and to say we're going to discuss all of these matters seems to give credibility to all of these alternative views and opinions without ever stating clearly, here is the position of the Catholic Church, and we want to explain this to you. The church as a mother must be a teacher, and if we don't use these kinds of events to teach and we are only expected to be the listener, you know, yes, we can learn some things from the world, but I guarantee you the world has a lot more to learn from the church than we do from the world. Yeah, sometimes it seems like the the, the church is trying to play the, the hip parent who wants to mix in with all the teenagers rather than teach them and guide them. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci was also at the conference. Uh, the Jesuit-educated doctor was asked how much he relies on his faith, but not necessarily his religious faith, to deal with pandemics and the like. It's very interesting when you use the word faith, and I'm glad you said not necessarily religious faith. It really is a combination of instinct, good judgment, and calling back from experience. Uh, that, you know, in some respects is a, a non-religious faith issue. Your thoughts on that answer, Bishop, and were the Catholic Medical Association members invited to this event on health care at the Vatican? You know, my, if they were, I was not informed of, of the fact. And, you know, Bishop Conley of, of Lincoln is now the Episcopal advisor. I, I was temporarily back in, in that office for a little while last year, mm -hmm. uh, but I've turned that over to him. But I do stay in close contact with them, and I'm sure they would have notified me and would have read in their materials whether an invitation had been received by them to participate in this conference. I wish they were, uh, because they are a strong and, and faithful organization. But when mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci talks about instinct, in some ways, perhaps he's talking about natural law. But that instinct, mm. you know, can easily be corrupted by the culture, and people can begin to think that what I am convinced of by the culture somehow is now a part of my instinct. And that may not necessarily be true because the culture does not listen to God, but our consciences must listen to God. We must listen to God, and we must make an objective view of what is the nature of the human person. And if we don't identify and hold to that, then this instinct you know, can be an instinct for self-destruction rather than an instinct for preservation. Mm -hmm. We will leave it there. Bishop Fasha, thank you for your clarity, for your time. For more on the work of the Catholic Medical Association, you can visit cathmed.org. Thank you, Bishop. You're very welcome, Raymond. As the world chases after shifting ideals and evolving moralities, my next guest has proposed a different way. In his new book, The Unbroken Thread, op-ed editor at the New York Post, Sora Bamari, makes a forceful and moving case for the ethical and religious traditions that created civilization through the lives of the men and women who exemplify them. Saurabh, welcome to the program. Uh, I, I love you're sitting on my set. That's pretty good. I'm stuck here in New Orleans, and you're there. Now, I know this book was very personal to you. Uh, you wrote it for your son, Maximilian, as a way to pass along an inheritance. What is that inheritance, and why take this approach? Well, my Max is named after St. Maximilian Kolbe. Uh, Raymond, I know you know his story uh, very well, mm -hmm. the, the Franciscan friar who laid down his life for a stranger at Auschwitz and was canonized as a martyr in 1982. Um, so when I heard that story, I was just about to be received into the church, and it really stuck with me, and I couldn't get it out of my system, and I had to do something with it, so I named my son after him. But I felt that naming him after that great saint and the ideal of true freedom that his action mm -hmm. represented is not enough. I had to do something more because we have a, a culture that constantly tells people that freedom just means being able to choose from the widest range of options and just gratifying yourself. And it actually makes mm -hmm. it very hard for ordinary people to just live decent lives of virtue, let alone do those kinds of heroic things that, uh, for example, St. Maximilian did. So the book is my attempt, in a way, to tether my son 
to his namesake's traditional ideals and to lasso mm. him, as it were, to the whole kind of Judeo-Christian and classical foundation of the West so that he grows up with a, a, a richer and truer account, account of what it means to be fully human, what it means to be responsible. And that mm. collection of things I call tradition. Yeah, and you, you ask 12 questions in the course of the book. Uh, questions like, can you be spiritual without being religious? Uh, now, about a quarter of Americans identify as spiritual but not religious, according to a pupil a couple of years ago. How important is it to identify one's life with a particular faith for the sake of society? I mean, responding to this question, I know you explore the life of Victor Turner in the book. Tell us who he is and what he taught you. So Victor Turner and his uh, wife, Edith Turner, were a pair of anthropologists, British anthropologists. They were mm -hmm. militantly atheistic communists, and card-carrying communists, but um, they were interested in how religious ritual helps traditional societies um, structure their lives. So for example, in the West, in the modern West, the passage to adulthood just sort of happens imperceptibly. It, they bleed into each other, whereas all traditional societies have some sort of rite of passage. So they went to central South Africa, to Zambia, and lived with a tribe called the Ndembu uh, for two and a half years, observing their rituals. And what they noticed is that their rituals do all sorts of things that are good for the community. They help um, by enacting certain rituals, for example, they help people get along who otherwise would be at each other's throats. Or they remind the chieftain that ultimately his role is to serve the people, not just to wield power for its own sake. And mm -hmm. then when they came back to Britain, they felt this great longing for that kind of what he called transcendence that he found in African ritual. And they tried out a whole bunch of churches, but they felt that the most ritualistic religion of all was the Catholic Church, so that they had abandoned their, their atheism and they became Roman Catholics as a result of that experience. Mm -hmm. And what that teaches us in a larger way is the problem with being spiritual but not religious isn't that these people don't have religiosity. These kinds of Americans, they actually, they do all sorts of religious things. They go to spinning and yoga and, and drink juices on Fridays or what have you. So they do religious things. What they lack is a shared account of ultimate meaning. And that's what makes true yeah. religion, is not just the ritual, but ritual combined with a shared account of what, what life is all about. And all traditional societies have some aspect of that. And I don't think you can yeah. have spirituality without religion. No, it's the old Fulton Sheen line, you know, when the church drops something, where people drop the church, the secular world picks it up. So, you know, you don't go to mass, but you hit the yoga mat, you know, every Sunday. Uh, in The Unbroken Thread, you write about the famous 1978 commencement address given by Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn and uh, his view of the West. He said of intellectuals, your scholars, he charged, are free in a legal sense, but they're hemmed in by the idols of the prevailing fad. There is no open violence as in the East. However, a selection dictated by fashion and the need to accommodate mass standards frequently prevents the most independently minded persons from contributing to public life and gives rise to dangerous herd instincts. Should I be asked whether I would propose the West, such as it is today, as a model to my country today, I would frankly have to answer negatively. No, I could not recommend your society as an ideal for the transformation of ours. What was the reaction to this Soviet dissident's appraisal of American intellectual life? And given what we're seeing in school curricula today and the academy, it's hard to argue with uh, his argument there. Ab absolutely, Raymond. So he was what we would now say he was canceled, he was, he was ratioed, which is what happens on Twitter where someone uh, expresses an opinion that goes against the orthodoxy and everyone uh, uh, you know, assails him or her and mocks him and sort of drums him out of the public square unless he or she issues a kind of public apology. So he sensed then, which it was very hard to see in 1978, which is why he got attacked so viciously by the mainstream media. And even some many conservative thinkers and writers basically said he's a kook, he's a reactionary, he's a theocrat, mm -hmm. he's an authoritarian. But he diagnosed something very well, which is that in the West, unfortunately, something had gone wrong with the idea of freedom where it had been reduced to just the kind of bare legalism 
and the right of private actors to do whatever they wish. In practice, that made it so that a lot of the media were controlled by private corporations. A lot of the ac ac academy was taken over by um, uh, 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 you know, conformist ideologues. And so although he, they, everyone had paper liberty, in fact, a, a kind of conformism prevailed across the West. And that dynamic, I would argue, has only accelerated since then. You see what happens with um, uh, censorship on the internet, even though we were technically uh, supposed to have uh, freedom of speech rights. As you know, I work for the New York Post, and we recently gone, went through this experience where we exercise one of our most fundamental rights, which is to examine you know, Hunter Biden and his then uh, vice president, his father, then vice president Joe Biden, and their dealings with foreign companies. And um, big tech censored us um, outright and suspended our, our account, even though the story itself is undisputed to this day. So there is a kind of tendency toward tyrannism and tyranny in the West itself that we have to be alert to, and I think it's gotten worse since um, uh, Solzhenitsyn issued his Jeremiah. Sora Bamari, we will leave it there. I, we're definitely going to have you back. I particularly love the letter to your son and to all our sons at the end of the book, but for that, you'll have to read The Unbroken Thread. Thanks for being here tonight. The book is available at bookstores everywhere. The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos by Saurabh Amari. Go get it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Religious freedom is a human right. In fact, it goes to the heart of what it means to be human, to think freely, to follow our conscience, to change our beliefs if our hearts and minds lead us uh, to do so, to express those beliefs in public uh, and in private. And so our promise to the world is that the Biden-Harris administration will protect and defend religious freedom around the world. We will maintain America's long-standing leadership on this issue. That was Secretary of State Anthony Blinken at the release of the State Department's 2020 Report on International Religious Freedom. Here to discuss that report is the former ambassador at large for international religious freedom, Sam Brownback. Ambassador, thank you for being here. I want to get your thoughts on Secretary Blinken's presentation of that report this week. Uh, the report landed at the same time as that major conflict broke out in Israel, um, and it got lost in the shuffle of events. From Blinken's remarks, it sounds like the new administration is committed to defending and promoting religious freedom. Is that the impression you got after reading the report? Oh, it is. It is. It is the impression I've gotten. It's the impression that uh, that I've had. You know, there's been this kerfuffle about, uh, well, okay, we, the, the Trump administration, had put it as a foundational human right, as a primary human right, and they're saying, well, it's amongst the panoply of human rights. But you listen to this report, you listen to the presentation, you see the actions. They cited another Chinese official and lifted, took his visa rights away because of persecution of Falun Gong. They're, uh, they're acting in favor of religious freedom. Good. Okay. We, we should also mention that the former ambassador at large, you, uh, you have no successor. No replacement has been named by the State Department. Now, earlier this month, several members of Congress, uh, four from the House and the Senate, sent a letter to the president calling for a nomination of a new ambassador at large to religious freedom. Why do you think they haven't filled your post, given the rise in global I, persecution we're seeing? Yeah, it takes some time. I wasn't announced in the Trump administration until July, uh, and then it we got I got hung up in the Senate amongst my old colleagues. I didn't get uh, through until <laughs> February of the next year. So this this takes a little bit of time, but I think it is time now to start pushing on the administration to do something here. We've just got so many problems of religious persecution, the genocides taken in the in place in the world today have as their root often, uh, most cases, because of a religious persecution like the Uyghurs or Muslims in China that the Chinese are pushing mm -hmm. out. Uh, so we really, they need somebody in this role because of the centrality of what religious issues and the religious conflict and the religious persecution is taking place now. Well, this drives so many of these conflicts we're seeing globally. Uh, Blinken singled out in the report uh, a number of countries of concern, uh, Iran's harsh treatment of religious minorities, ethnic cleansing in Burma, uh, the persecution of Christians and Muslims in Russia. Um, here's what he had to say about Saudi Arabia and China. Watch. Saudi Arabia remains the only country in the world 
without a Christian church, though there are more than a million Christians living in Saudi Arabia. And China uh, broadly criminalizes religious expression and continues to make, commit crimes against humanity and genocide against Muslim Uyghurs and members of other religious and ethnic minority groups. Why has there been so little progress opening up Saudi Arabia uh, to non-Muslim houses of worship, uh, Sam? Yeah, that's been a tough one. And I worked on it. Other people have. Our big hope has been because of the UAE's opening taking place, uh, and they invited uh, Pope Francis there, and he spoke the first time a papal visit ever took place on the Arabian Peninsula. We were hoping that as UAE opened up, that the Saudis would open up. And that's the sort of comment you get privately from officials, but they still haven't done it. They, you know, they, they cite difficulties uh, there in doing it, but they could. They historically did have churches in the past. Uh, during the times of Muhammad, they had churches there. They can have churches there now. They just haven't done it, but it's time. The Saudis really need to move forward. And with a million Christians there, they've got a demand for churches. Mm -hmm. You heard the, uh, the mention of the Uyghur genocide in China. Does Blinken in this report go far enough to chronicling what, you, what, what is actually happening in China vis-a-vis -vis the persecution of uh, Christians, the Catholic Church imprisonment of, of priests and bishops, and, and Catholic laymen like Jimmy Lai and others? Uh, they go pretty far. Uh, I, I think it could go further. Uh, and it just keeps escalating is the problem in China. It's, it's not as if the Chinese Communist Party has been caught red-handed in their war on faith, and they're now kind of shrinking away from it. They've been caught red-handed, and they're proud of it. Uh, and they just keep pushing it and keep tightening things down. And so more and more keeps coming out, the forced abortions uh, of minority uh, people of faith that's taking place that's come out, this use of artificial intelligence and a creation of a virtual mm -hmm. police state where people of faith are monitored and tracked all the time and given a social credit score. Uh, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger in China. They are the ones that are perfecting the systems of the future, I'm afraid, for religious persecution, mm -hmm. and they're going to export them around the world. Yeah. Uh, as a former ambassador at large uh, for religious freedom, what do you think is missing from this report? I know you've read it extensively. Um, I don't think that there's much missing from it. The report is just is really meant to chronicle the things that took place last year. If anything is missing, it's because the year was under lockdown most of the time, and so most of it's reporting on reporting rather than direct, mm. okay, we saw this or we met with that group because there, right. just, there weren't a lot of meetings that took place. But it's a good chronicle. It's generally considered the gold standard around the world for what's taking place in religious persecution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think you can get a lot out of this report. Yeah, and we are seeing um, Lord David Alton in England and reactions in other parts of the world really uh, galvanizing support around human rights and calling out this religious persecution, particularly the Uyghur uh, uh, internment in China. That, that, that's a good sign, and much of that is the result of your work and the work of the Trump administration, you know, prior, before the Biden folks came in. Uh, you will be co-chairing an International Religious Freedom Summit in D.C. this July. What do you hope to achieve with this event? Really getting the grassroots movement, pulling together, galvanizing it, and then pressing forward. The religious freedom movement needs to go from really the elite levels in government, and it needs to get in the grassroots. It needs to be a movement mm -hmm. where people every day are saying and pushing themselves, I deserve this right to do with my own soul as I choose. So what we hope to do is to bring together a lot of the leaders of religious freedom from around the world uh, and then get them introduced to each other, building relationships so that we can press this movement on forward. We've got about 60 convening partners, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Notre Dame Law School, uh, amongst them a number of other groups from various uh, religious groups all coming together not around a common theology because we don't agree on theology. It's around a common human right, and this has got to be driven and more and more effectively at the grassroots level. 
Great. Sam Brownback, thank you for being here. You can find out more about that International Religious Freedom Summit at irfsummit.com. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks, Raymond. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. 